thank you guys so much for coming. Um, it's it always means so much when you guys turn out and are interested in what we're doing and what is going on um, in the world of refugees and immigrants. Um, so thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Mary Poole. I'm the executive director of Soft Lanny Missoula, and we're a nonprofit in town. I see a lot of familiar faces, but just in case you're you're new to this space, um, we work with refugees and immigrants, helping them uh, get acquainted and thrive in our community. Um, we provide all sorts of uh, programming for all ages of uh, folks here that are our new neighbors. And we also do a lot of ed education and outreach for the Missoula community. So you guys can all be part of this and learn alongside of us. Um, we have been at this for seven and a half years now, which is just crazy to say. All of you clapping have been here with us all that whole seven and a half years, so thank you so much. Um, but this lecture tonight is our first in-person lecture since um, COVID, since the before times. So we used to do this every spring uh, in partnership with the university, and I hope that we can continue to do that now. Um, and we, we picked this topic because so much has changed, as you'll see, over the last couple administrations, but especially over the last couple years in how we as a community can welcome refugees, um, asylees, humanitarian parolees into our city and how that is a response to what's happening in the world. So we have a, a wonderful panel of uh, folks, uh, experts here to talk to us tonight. Um, we're going to start our, off with Kari Hong, who is an incredible immigration attorney in town. We're so thankful that you're here. Um, and all of our panelists and our speaker, um, they have their bios on the um, program that went out to you tonight. Um, so we're not going to spend time reading those, but um, they're all there. Um, and I just wanted to thank a few people before we get going. Um, Gillian and the Humanities Institute, thank you so much for being our partner in this again. Um, the Humanities Institute is a wonderful um, program here on campus, um, and you're always game for collaborating with us and having some fun, so thank you. Um, thank you, Kari. Thank you to our speakers, um, our, and also to our moderator, Chris Hislop from Montana World Affairs Council. Always great to work with Chris. He's incredibly thoughtful um, and very inclusive in his moderation. Um, I also wanted to take a minute to thank Soft Landing's own Carly Graff, who did a ton of the lift to put this on and organized this for you tonight. Um, and Carly's one of our newer staff, although you've been here almost a year now. Um, and we're just so, so, so excited to have her on staff to bring this type of quality programming to our community. Um, and then I would also like to thank MCAT. MCAT is here tonight. Um, they're a wonderful organization in town, Missoula Community Access Television, and they've given us a grant tonight to film this for all the folks that can't make it. Um, they're very generous with those. So um, really quick, just a little housekeeping. After the lecture and the panel ends, we are going to do um, an audience Q&A. Um, if you didn't receive a, a note card and you think you might have a question or want a question, um, this is an intimate audience. This is a, a good uh, conversation space. There's note cards up at front. There's pens up there. You're welcome to grab one and just jot down your questions. Or if you have your own notebook paper, that's fine too. Um, and then we'll be collecting those questions um, as the panel speaks. And Chris will um, kind of group them together, see if there's some themes that come out, and see if we can get through a few questions of yours tonight too. So please participate if you'd like. Um, and yeah, lastly, I'd like to say thank you um, for all of you, and we'll get started uh, by Chris coming on up and introducing our speaker. Thank you, everyone. Greetings, everyone. I'm Chris Hislop from the Montana World Affairs Council. A quick thanks to Mary and all of our friends at Soft Landing uh, for bringing us together in this space tonight. Really appreciate that, and thank you all for coming. And I'll just say it's a real honor to share this stage with our panelists tonight. I'm really looking forward to that um, element. But before we get to that, uh, we're going to hear some remarks from Kari Hong, some kind of foundational remarks that are going to help us put this into situ. Kari has been practicing immigration law for the past 20 years. She's been a solo practitioner, a tenured Boston College law professor, and currently is Ninth Circuit attorney 
for the Florence Immigrant and Refugee Rights Project. Her clients have included asylum seekers, separated mothers, and deported veterans. As a lawyer, she's represented more than 80 people in immigration hearings, filed more than 100 agency appeals, and prepared more than 250 Ninth Circuit cases, resulting in over 125 decisions, 75 settlements, and 30 published opinions, including a 2021 full court victory. As a scholar, she's written 19 articles and published dozens of op-eds that appeared in the Washington Post and Boston Globe. She's been quoted in dozens of newspaper articles on immigration policy, including the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, CNN, and USA Today. She's a graduate of Columbia Law School and Swarthmore College. In 2003, she was a law clerk to Judge Sid Thomas. When she, was, when she lived in Billings during that year, she met her wife on a blind date, and 15 years later, they moved to Missoula to raise their children here. She's an adjunct law professor in town, and when not talking about immigration law, she's likely to be on the hockey rink. Could you please join me in welcoming Kari Hong? Thank you. Thank you, Soft Landing. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you all for being here. Uh, immigration law is an area where information is a mile wide, but only an inch deep. When our nation was debating health care, our media helped us facilitate nuanced discussions about the Swiss model, the single payer model, the advantages of different systems. But most Americans cannot explain how people get green cards, how people become citizens, and how people can get asylum. So this talk is an attempt to fill that gap. When we have the same facts, we then can work together to find some real solutions. So I was asked to speak on the ways we welcome. I'm going to talk about who, the how, the why, when we welcome, and I have four topics. I'll start with the, the current different existing remedies that are, in, that are in the law. I'm gonna go back and look at the history, a brief history of immigration and asylum law, what is happening at the border, and what reforms are possible. So basically, I'd like to talk about what is happening wrong or now, what is wrong, and what we can do to make it better. So let's start with how people are getting protections in the United States. There are four general categories that give status to those fleeing persecution and danger. There are two types that most people know about. There's refugee status. This is for people who are outside of the country. They are fleeing con conflict that is occurring on a countrywide basis. They remain in refugee camps, oftentimes for months or years. And when they arrive in the United States, they have, a, they have legal status, they have work authorization, and they have a pathway to a green card. They also receive public and private support from organizations like Soft Landing um, to help integrate uh, refugees into the surrounding communities. A second remedy that most people have heard of is called asylum. This is for people inside the United States. It's based on not a countrywide basis, but an individualized risk. If someone can show that they are in danger based on one of five specific categories, either their race, religion, nationality, a particular social group, or their political opinion, and they go before an asylum officer or a judge, they will be granted status. Um, and it is allows them, it gives them a pathway to a green card However, unlike the refugees, there are no services provided to asylum seekers. So they are on their own from day one to, to, to make their way in the United States. Now there are two other types of protections that are available. One is called temporary protected status. Congress created this in 1990, and it gives authorization to the president to give temporary status to groups of people inside of the United States when there are humanitarian reasons. Um, it usually arises due to political instability in the country or natural disasters. Now, currently, there are about 350,000 uh, 350, people in the United States who have TPS status. This chart right here um, 
has the year that they arrived and the country that they arrived. And as you can see, about 90% of everyone who currently has TPS arrived from a Central American country. Um, Trump administration tried to end TPS for everyone. Um, and the courts uh, went through court challenges. The court actually authorized him to do so. He, so he was planning to deport all 350,000 people. Um, right before that happened, the election occurred, and then Biden was able to reinstate everyone. Um, so as a result, though, it's clear that Congress could and should um, let these people get status, because when they are not, and until they're not, they are stuck in legal limbo. Parole is a second form of humanitarian relief that's part of our immigration law. It's been part of our immigration law since, um, you know, for decades. And it too is temporary. It can be revoked at any time. And it's also case by case, person by person. Um, it is currently being used by the Biden administration to give temporary status to Afghan evacuees and Ukrainians um, instead of giving those populations either asylum status or refugee status. And also, I'll talk about this later, but both the temporary protections given to Ukrainians and uh, uh, Afghan nationals are scheduled to expire this year. So let's turn to who is receiving these benefits. For refugees, this chart is about 20 years worth of documenting where people are coming from in the world. The light blue is from people from Africa and as you can see, for the last couple of years, Africa has been the largest um, region where refugees have come from. Now, something also to look at is, is what are the religions of the refugees? Um, the color purple are, are Christian refugees. And as you can see in the last 10 years, there's been a rise of Christian um, refugees and also a decline of Muslim refugees who are in the light blue category. As for who's getting asylum, this is a recent chart. And again, this is from people within the interior. And as you can see, uh, uh, people from China are the leading group, and then Venezuela. Um, for perspective, though, um, refugee status and asylum status make up only 16% of all legal immigration in the United States. The way that our modern immigration system is designed, two thirds of all immigrants come through family-based programs, about 20% from work, and about then 16% from asylum and refugees. Now, the number of asylum seekers are very low as well. Currently, we're, there are about 30,000 asylum seekers each year who are coming into the United States. Um, and from 1990 to 2000, which is what this chart tracks, you can see that it was as low as 5,000, and, it, and its height at 2001 was 40,000 asylum seekers. So we're talking about a relatively low population of both refugees and asylum seekers in the United States. Now, the numbers for refugees are also low. In this chart, uh, the blue line, I'm excited to have one of these pointers, um, the blue line is the number that the president can set each year under, as authorized by Congress, to determine the numbers of refugees that would be allowed into the country. And the orange line is the number of actual refugees who are, who are actually going to be admitted. And as you can see, when, in 1980, when this law first came into being, um, 240,000 refugees were authorized to come to the United States, and a little over 200,000 came. There was a dramatic drop off, and in particular, during the Trump years, it actually got down to an authorized group of 10,000, and for the first time in our history, in, two, in, in 2020, zero refugees came into the United States. Um, Biden has increased the ceiling to 125,000, but in actuality, that's not being realized. In 2021, only 11,000 refugees entered, and in 2022, last year, um, uh, 25,000 refugees came, and those missing 10,000 or missing 100,000 are never recouped or, or uh, uh, put over for the next year. Um, we also are not the world's refuge. Um, this is a listing of the top 10 countries who receive a proportion of immigrants based on their population. And as you can see, the United States is not even in the top 10. 
if we look at raw numbers, uh, we also do not receive a large number of total refugees compared to the rest of the world. Germany leads the world. They have a hundred, or they have one million refugees that they have each year, and they have a population of 83 million people. The U.S. took a total of about 55,000 of combined asylum and refugee uh, seekers last year, and we have a population of 330 million. So next I want to talk about is why are these numbers as low as they are, and should we do more? And before answering that question, I think it's important to ask, why does it matter if the United States is behind in the numbers of refugees and asylum seekers that we're taking? Um, and we should look at why these numbers have been decreasing in the past 40 years and in the past seven years in particular. So I want to answer that question of why it matters and why we should have more immigrants um, with some practical answers. So I want to put aside some questions of morality for now. And the loss of immigrants hurt us in a very concrete way in the 2020 pandemic. In March, 2000, in March 2020, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, Germany was able to arrange for the 14,000 existing doctors who were among the Syrian refugees in their country to immediately and um, expedite. They've already been trained as doctors and to expedite their licensing so that they could provide immediate relief to the population that was suffering from COVID. In the United States, by contrast, in March 2020, what we did is that we had a small amount of doctors who were in serving in the military. Um, and it's a talk for another day, but there used to be a program called ManV, whereby we recruited the best and the brightest from US colleges and universities who were trained as doctors, engineers, language specialists. And we promised them that if you served in the military for five years, we would expedite your citizen and let you become a US citizen. Trump broke that promise. So for the, the people, the immigrants who had uh, risked their lives for the United States, um, all of a sudden, instead of continuing with the promise that we'd made to, to make them citizens, we um, deported those uh, who were serving in the US military. And as you can imagine, they then have obvious asylum problems of returning to their home country after serving in the US military, as well as national security problems, given that they were serving in our US military. Now, as a footnote, Biden started that up. But in March 2020, because Trump was ending this program, we had foreign doctors who were in the military willing to serve in our hospitals, who, if they were lucky, were sitting behind a desk. And if they weren't lucky, they were already in deportation proceedings. Now, our post-pandemic response when it came to um, you know, those who were helping our country wasn't much better. France categorically gave every frontline worker who had helped out during the COVID emergency automatic French citizenship. In the United States, we didn't do that. Even worse, we have 2.2 million people here on DACA. These were people who came to the United States as children. Um, and they were educated in our public schools, they went to our public universities, they went to our medical schools. Um, 200,000 of the dreamers are currently doctors, nurses, um, and hospital workers who stepped up and were helping the COVID patients during the pandemic. That group still doesn't have status. I guess they have temporary status, but again, it can be revoked at any moment and they don't have any pathway to permanent status. So that's a concrete example of why immigrants and, and, and a generous and flexible immigration policy is to our country's benefit. More globally, uh, we have a moral argument as to why more immigrants are needed. With the exception of the native population, most of us in this room are here because of past and generous immigration laws. Now, as a practical argument, the children of immigrants succeed by wild, um, by wild measures. There's an economic argument. Even undocumented immigrants pay $12 billion in taxes. Immigrants also start small businesses at twice the rate of American, uh, 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 native-born Americans. And also, immigrants were uh, largely responsible in founding 18% of the Fortune 500 companies. As another practical reason, Social Security is scheduled to be depleted by 2035. And the, the most immediate and, and uh, reliable fix would be to increase our immigration numbers. 
So I'd like to point out that all these arguments were behind or were around and circulating in a society to support the reason for more immigrants. And then after Trump's administration um, came into to power, we saw the impact of what our world is like without immigrants. And um, in, to, in 2016, the Trump administration, one of his first and, and always uh, top priorities was to reduce immigration or even eliminate it in many, many ways. He made over 1,000 rule changes to how legal immigration happens. He was successful in reducing legal immigration and the costs were extremely harmful to our economy. Economists estimate about there's about a nine point billion dollar loss from the reduced immigration during these years. We lost needed workers in important sectors, including doctors, engineers, and those who are caring for our sick and our elderly. And economists also attributed the rise in the continued inflation rates to the um, and to then the subsequent supply chain problems to the loss um, in in workers. Um, this also hit home. Montana has um, a shortage of people to care for those in nursing homes, and immigration could be a cure for this, and we are not seeking this option. Uh, we are also losing a window to do so. There is actually a worldwide shortage of doctors and nurses. Canada and the, United, and, and the UK are aggressively and affirmatively recruiting doctors and nurses from other countries, and the U.S. still isn't legalizing those who are in our country, and we are not making any efforts to recruit more. Now, there is a loud and powerful anti-immigrant sentiment in Montana and across the United States to justify these policies. And as a matter of history, anti-immigrant sentiment is not new. Um, for these quotes on the slides, um, does anyone have any guesses about who might have said them? Um, one says, for those who come hither are generally of the most ignorant, stupid sort of their own nation. Um, and you can see the Spaniards, Italians, French and Russians, and Swedes are generally of what we swarthy complexion, and the Germans also um, uh, can only be ac accepted. Anyone have any guess about who made all of these comments about immigrants coming to the United States? What's that? Which one? No, George Washington believed in asylum. Yes, it was Benjamin Franklin. And he actually said it in 1750 before we had a country. Um, and, um, and as a serious note, though, you can see that this, there's the same backlash against immigrants today in the, in the rhetoric, that immigrants are always deemed to be permanently foreign. They are different looking and different acting. They cannot assimilate, and they will destroy American values or culture. Now, throughout the U.S. history, you know, we have also had these pro-immigrant sentiments of wanting to welcome immigrants, as well as this, these anti-immigrant sentiments always in existence and realistically always in coexistence. It was always just a question about who had the levers of power in determining the policy at any given time. Um, there are two cartoons from 1870, so they're both in the same period. Um, and the one on the left here um, is one that's rebuking the hypocrisy of people who were trying to close the, the borders um, in the 1880s to the immigrants who came before them. And you can see the political significance of pushing down the ladder after they had, re after they had climbed um, over the wall. Now, the one on the right has racist depictions of Irish immigrants and Chinese immigrants, and they are literally eating Uncle Sam. Um, to express the fears of how immigration hurts the United States. Now, I also often hear people say that their family did it the right way. And why can't people just get in line and follow the rules? Well, you can get your immigration file from the U.S. government. Um, and during the Trump years, there were a couple immigration lawyers who would then look at it and tell you how your family arrived. And I'm willing to bet everyone a, a dinner, a very nice dinner, that none of us, none of us would be here if the laws that apply to immigrants today apply to the time when our family members were arriving. Um, now, as a brief, brief, brief overview um, uh, of immigration law, 
for the first 100 years, we basically didn't have any restriction. We absolutely had open borders. Um, where despite the rhetoric and despite the laws, um, people could come and go, even if there were restrictive laws, it's a practical matter, there was no agency to enforce them. So people would just go into the interior and stay there. Um, in 1790, the first citizenship law of our country gave citizenship not to all people, but only to the people who were free white people. Um, by its inception, um, our citizenship uh, laws excluded slaves, excluded free slaves, excluded Native Americans, and excluded indentured servants. Now also, for those who weren't white, um, beginning in the 1800s, then we saw a more targeted um, anti-immigrant sentiment directed towards them. Um, the first uh, example of this exclusionary law was in 1882, when Congress excluded Chinese immigrants from coming into the United States. And even though our country was asking and recruiting um, uh, Chinese immigrants to be the laborers on our railroads, um, there was a backlash. Um, and as a result, this 1882 law is trying to prevent people from, from the laborers to having their wives, their families, and their friends join them in the hopes that they would just leave when they were done working on the railroads. Or as Mitt Romney said in a debate recently, or a couple of years ago, that they would just self-deport. In 1924, um, there was an infamous law that became our immigration policy for the next 40 years. It was written by members of the KKK and it provided that our country would have race-based quotas. Now I put race in quotes because in the 1800s and the 1900s, there were dozens of racial and ethnic categories in which immig immigrants, especially those from Catholic countries, were considered not white. Definitely not like the WASP Americans who, in, in, who were living in the country like Benjamin Franklin considered themselves to be white. So the exclusions were for the Chinese, the Japanese, the Italians, the Irish, Jewish, and many others. And up until the 1940s, there was a law in place that if a white woman, a white American woman, married a Japanese man, she would lose her US citizenship. In 1929, there's also a law where Congress passed the illegal entry in the illegal re-entry laws uh, with the express purpose to keep out Mexican immigrants. In 2019, a federal district court judge found that these laws violated the Constitution because they were racist in design and racist in application, including modern day application. Um, this decision is on appeal. But the takeaway, for me at least, is from our history, it's hard to boast that any of our family members had been better immigrants than today's immigrants when the laws very much had these ugly overtones of racism and exclusion. I mean, the right way was oftentimes the white way. And for those of us in the room whose family members arrived before 1965, we have benefited from those preferences. The modern uh, era in immigration law started in 1952. This is when our country started rethinking immigration as having the utility and having the pillars of family, of work, and refugees and asylum. What was transformative was the 1965 Immigration Act. This was celebrated as a very important milestone in immigration law. This is when race-based quotas were finally eliminated, and this was part of the civil rights laws enacted by President Johnson. Now, there was a debate about whether it was intended or not, but there's no debate that this law reshaped the ethnic diversity of the United States. Now, in the 1980s, this was kind of the, 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 the height of the pro-immigrant sentiment in our country. Um, immigrants had many, many pathways to get status. R President Ronald Reagan had granted two large amnesty laws to help laborers. We had the 1980 Refugee Act. The laws were generous, and there was both a policy and practice of letting people in. Now, this all changed in 1996 when Congress passed the IRA, the Immigrant Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, which is also known as IRA-IRA. This was during a, an election year and was a very pernicious form, very pernicious law that has stayed with us. It was very far-reaching, very draconian. Basically, before IRA-IRA, there were ways people could have come to the United States by marriage or if they were here for seven years. After IRA-IRA, if you crossed the border, you couldn't get status. 
even if you married a U.S. citizen, if you left the country, you couldn't come back for 10 years. And there were also speed deportation, deportations for the first time in history in which one officer can deport someone without a lawyer, without evidence, without a fact finder, and without appeal. Now, the IRA-IRA law did not end unlawful immigration, but it created the 11 million people who are permanently without status in our country. If you look at the chart, this is where 1996, that's when IRA IRA happened, and you can see the jump of people in undocumented status. So the answer as to why people don't get in line is that simply there's no more line. Um, turning then to the history of asylum law, um, the USS St. Louis was a ship in uh, 1939 who was, that was carrying 937 Jewish people who were fleeing Nazi Germany. The US and Canada turned away the ship. The majority of people on the ship eventually perished in the Holocaust when they were sent back to Germany. After World War II, this event motivated the creation of the United Nations, the World Treaties, and the United States to do a better job at protecting refugees and asylum seekers. In the United States, we saw this being informed where President Truman and Congress gave temporary relief to people from certain countries. Um, these displaced persons were allowed to stay, but eventually the programs were expired. Um, in 1965, Congress was creating more admissions for, for communist countries. And then again, it was 1980 that the Congress then created the Refugee Act, which is the modern Asylum and, and Refugee Act, whereby many people then were allowed to uh, legalize their status. Now, I quickly just want to share a quote from President Eisenhower in which he explained the value that asylum seekers have always added to the country in a state of the nation um, address. He made it very clear that our country was proven great because it, we had the proof that everyone was trying to come to the United States and that with them they brought in the ideals of freedom, religious faith, um, which renewed um, the American values. Now, 1996 fundamentally reduced immigration, but as I mentioned before, in 2006, Trump ushered in over a thousand rule changes to end immigration. Um, uh, so again, in the first time in our history, zero refugees were admitted in 2020. So with this backdrop, I want to talk about what's happening at the border now. What's notable is that President Biden has not ended Trump's policy and is actually building upon some of them. So let's start with the southern border. There are three facts that people need to know. Even though people think the southern border stops immigration from Mexico or Central America, Half of the people at the southern border are from all over the world. They're from Russia, Cuba, Brazil, Haiti, Eritrea. Second fact, starting in 2018, our government stopped letting people come into the United States to, to seek asylum. They were forced across the border and they remain in Mexico in squalors, in refugee, in their own refugee camps. Not ones organized by the UN, but just de facto ones that they're building. So the third fact is that people have no means to feed themselves, to clothe themselves, to house themselves in Mexico. There's no medical care, no food, and cartels target them with robberies, rape, and murder. After family separation stopped, immediately afterwards, the Trump administration in 2018 started something called the Remain in Mexico program, where for the first time, people were not allowed to come to the United States when they wanted to, to seek asylum. Um, the remain in Mexico forced people to live in Mexico, Mexico, come into the United States just for their hearing at the border, and then have to leave. These were kangaroo courts. Only 1% of the people in the remain in Mexico actually received asylum. This program had obvious legal programs and was being challenged in court. So the Trump administration then tried to figure out what next to do. And in March 2020, they started something called Title 42. Now, in our history, we have a law that says certain immigrants with infectious diseases can't come into our country. We have used it on three occasions in our history. We used it in 1882, when we said Chinese immigrants have syphilis, so they can't come into our country. We used it in 1943, when we said Jewish immigrants can't come into our country because they have tuberculosis. In 2020, we brought it up a third time. And we said all of the immigrants at our southern border 
have COVID, so they can't come into the country. Now, this is a categorical statement. Um, it does not matter if anyone's been vaccinated. It does not matter if they have a negative COVID test. And it does not matter for all the other immigrants who enter by a plane or the northern, ben ben uh, northern border. Title 42 shuts down the border under this pretext that only those, only those immigrants will bring COVID into the United States. Now, Fox News claims that we have 2 million people coming into the southern border. This is not true. The Border Patrol had 2 million apprehensions. Often, the same person was apprehended multiple times. There was one person who was apprehended seven times. Those all count as individual apprehensions. The other thing that Fox News doesn't mention is that once apprehended, they're turned away under Title 42. Now, people in the United States aren't faring that much better. There is a two million case backlog in immigration courts. There's at least a four year delay to get a first hearing and it can take 10, 15 years before your immigration hearing is final. This was an increase of half a million cases from 2017. And this was one of the changes by the prior administration to try and end immigration by frustrating immigrants who were trying to get status. Now it's important to note that many, many of these people cannot get work permission um, to be here while they are waiting for this to occur. Now, Biden is not bringing relief. Title 42 is scheduled to be lifted on May 11th of this year. So on that result, on that day, Biden is imposing something called the third country transit ban, which advocates are calling the asylum ban. Because what it does, it ends asylum for everyone who enters the United, who had entered another country before arriving in the United States. So that means everyone who isn't a Mexican national can no longer get asylum. The other thing, it ends asylum for anyone who enters without inspection. Um, and in exchange for ending asylum, Biden said, well, I have a new program to provide parole to only certain countries, which would be Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. The problem with this is that people have to apply in their home countries. Can you imagine a Jewish person who had to ask Nazi Germany for asylum in the United States and then wait for the German government to grant the paperwork? It's unthinkable, which is why people can ask for asylum once they come into their country. The second problem is that these country-based protections ends asylum for minorities in every other country that face persecution religious minorities, LGBT individuals, political activists from all other countries cannot get asylum starting May 11th, 2023. And also, this protection is temporary. As I mentioned before, the Ukrainians and Afghans on parole are going to be expiring in, in August 2023 unless there's action. So likewise, for these po populations, they do not get a guarantee of status. They too will have an expired, uh, they will have status with an end date. Now, Biden is basically, in summary, <laughs> reducing uh, refugee status, eliminating asylum, has not extended TPS, and so is only using parole um, as a way to protect people from danger. So the next question is, does it have to be like this? And the answer is no. There are reforms that are possible. Um, an easy one is that in 20, 2016, under U.S. statistic, 88% of everyone at the southern border passed their first credible fear interview. That meant that everyone had met with an asylum officer and 88% qualified for asylum. Now, in Germany, that would have been enough to give them status and a work permit and let them on their way. In the U.S., because of IRA, IRA, we then move people into detention and make them fight for their cases there, or they force them into long court waits to file for asylum there. So the first reform of asylum is just to send in a thousand asylum officers to the border, screen these cases, and get people's status. Um, another reform is to end detention. Biden is planning to expand family detention in May of this year as well, um, which means children will again be in detention centers. Um, there is public support for immigration law. Um, it is, um, there is a lot, an appetite for immigration reform that's been growing in the United States. Um, and when people are asked about specific programs such as DACA or asylum, those numbers increase even more so. So I do want to end then with a moral call 
um, Ronald Reagan, on J January 19th, 1989, gave his last speech in office. And on this day, he was actually awarding the Presidential uh, Medal of Freedom to a certain man named Mike Mansfield, who you might have heard of. Um, and in these talks, President Reagan invoked the Statute of Liberty to remind us that we have a compact with our parents, our grandparents, and our ancestors to call for the U.S. to accept more immigrants and more asylum seekers. And he explained that immigrants are the people who renew American values because those are the ones who know dearly firsthand the value of democracy, of hard work, of religious freedom, and family. Um, you know, he had this quote, we lead the world because unique among nations, we draw our people, our strength from every country and every corner of the world. And so I just wanna leave you with something that's been haunting me um, from his speech. Um, where Reagan warned that if we ever close our doors to immigrants, America's leadership in the world would also be lost. Now, I mention this because we all are aware of problems that we have as a country. Um, and it also happened at a time when we did not have immigration reform for 40 years. That's an entire lost generation. So as our current country's decline in civil discourse and democratic norms is being challenged and hopefully being reformed, I would like to at least suggest that um, maybe as we rebuild our nation and we re rebuild our protection of democracy, it would seem to be in first order that we remember that welcoming immigrants is very much an important and valuable step in that project. First, let me thank you, Kari, for that really extraordinary um, lecture, if you will, that I think, I don't know if we could ask for a more expert and thorough treatment of a very complex and it, you know, often politically charged issue that puts us on some common ground for the rest of our discussion here tonight. So thank you very much for that. That was, that was absolutely outstanding. Yeah, absolutely. So. What we're going to do next is um, the, my colleagues here uh, at the panel will introduce themselves, and then we'll have a moderated discussion. And as Mary mentioned in the opening, uh, maybe some of you grabbed some of the cards on your way in. If you have a question, if something pops up, please uh, make note of that. There are some cards up here if you'd like. Uh, I would only ask as moderator uh, a couple things that I think all of us understand. One is. Um, we welcome your questions. Please keep them on point. Um, we know what we're talking about here tonight, and I would ask you to please keep that on the point of our discussion. And like we do here in Montana, this is a, a civil forum, and we ask for civil and respectful questions as well, please. So thank you for that, um, and we would welcome your questions when we come to that. So, But first, um, we will uh, ask our panelists here to introduce themselves. So I think... I, I was, let's start with you, Paul, and then move this way. You have a lapel microphone there. If you want to put that on and click it on. Paul, to you. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the question. Uh, my, na my, my name is Paul Mwingwa. I'm originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I've been in Missoula since 2018 with all my family. Um, I'm a student at Missoula College. And I'm also the delegate for refugee, for Refugee Congress, Montana Refugee Congress. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> Helen, are you, are you on? I just yeah. turned it, I yeah. just turned it on. Go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Helen Moss. Um, I came to Missoula in July of 2021. Um, and since January of last year, I've been working at Partnership Health Center in the refugee program. Um, I'm currently the senior community health specialist helping to coordinate health care and do community outreach, education, and program development. Um, prior to coming here, I taught in several countries, um, in, including Egypt, Kenya, South Africa, Angola, and Indonesia. And during that time, um, I often volunteered and worked with refugee programs and organizations and taught about the issues refugees faced in many of my middle school classrooms. 
uh, just in the hopes of raising awareness. And I'm really grateful to be able to work with the refugee population here in Missoula and to be able to be here tonight and share about access to health care. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know. How is that? Is that on? Can no, it's hear? not on. Just turn on the screen. You have to push a button of some variety. Okay. There we go. It's, the light is green. That must light be something Light is green. Good. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time to say, uh, introduce myself. But first, I just want to say thank you to you for caring about this issue and coming here tonight and uh, soft landing for everything you're doing here in the community. Um, it's that that matters. It's the caring that matters. So that's the foundation. I started off in a uh, humanitarian career, and I found myself in uh, Liberia, or in uh, Guinea, West Africa, where Liberian refugees had come across the border because they were fleeing the war. And I'm in this refugee camp, and I'm, it's sweltering hot, and its smell is just like, you know, all of us are just thinking, and I'm surrounded by all these people who are just fear and urgency and tensions were just written all over them. And I just said, what on earth caused this? How could people leave their homes and come to this place and we're in the middle of nowhere? Um, and so when I left that camp and left that work for the International Red Cross, um, I kept working for humanitarian organizations for 20 plus years, but I ended up following that question. It's like, what is the cause here? And I got to um, study it. Um, I did my doctorate in it. I've written a book. I've written a lot of different articles. Uh, and the question is, well, why is this? It, you know, of course, there's wars. And what begets a war? And then we have militias, and we have um, violence against women, and you have a lot of things that, as we've seen in this talk, starts the process of people saying, I can't do this anymore, and I need to find a better life. So what begets those things? And after I retired, because I'd worked sort of on those issues and trying to solve some of them, or at least get underneath them, um, I, I started looking at even a bigger picture. So this is where I am today, is what is the context in which we are living globally that causes us to have this kind of uh, interaction with each other? And for me, some of the things for, as an example, is our emphasis on growth. GDP growth, business growth, economic growth, um, growth in all different forms, as well as the individual. You know, we, we really, especially in this country, individualism, individualism. Well, family structures and communities and all kinds of things have disintegrated, and we're left with this meaning crisis, and some people will call it. Um, so that's currently where I am. Um, it feels to me like we're at a pivot point, like this is an evolutionary point. And much like the lobefish um, became tetrapods and they found themselves gaining structure and lungs and shoulders and hips in order to get to being able to be on land, I think we're at that point. So what are those skills and capacities that we need to be learning and I think are? I think we are way beyond the beginning of that pivot point. And that's exciting to me. So that's where I am today. And it takes, it's a quite a dive from refugee camps and the refugee discussion to this. But I think it all fits together. And that's what I like to be considering. That's oh. a bit I would do. Thank you very much for that, Kim. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm here kind of wringing my hands. I can't wait to get started. Sure. I mean, this is a really extraordinary panel. So I'll kick it off with a few questions again. If and as you think of some questions, please write them on a card. I think our uh, colleagues from Soft Landing can grab them from you. If you have them, you can just raise it up. Um, let me start with you, Paul. Um, in Kari's remarks, it was interesting that you, um, you mentioned the uh, St. Louis, the, the boat, uh, the, the ship. And uh, in Kari's remarks, that uh, she was mentioning the United Nations. And um, 
many of you know the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, is um, almost, uh, a, in fact, they consider themselves almost a state for the stateless. It is a unique, um, it's a unique organization with a unique mission. Um, and for many people who are refugees, um, they often, their first touch is often with UNHCR field staff. And so, Paul, I wonder if you might say a couple words about the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. They offer durable solutions, they call them, to, to refugees. Could you talk a little bit about what are the durable solutions that a refugee uh, uh, receives uh, as choices from UNHCR? Um, so let's start there. I'll have a follow-up question for you, Paul, but let's start there, please. Thank you, Chris, for that question. As I said, I am from Congo, and I leave Congo in 2002. I crossed the border to Rwanda, and I was received the hand of UNHCR. UNHCR tried to protect us for 18 years in Rwanda, and they look the solution for us to how we can rebuild our life in that situation. And for them, they have three way or three durable solution. The first one, they was looking how they can ask us voluntarily to go back to our country. And in, in Congo, even right now, they're still in war in trouble. And for, I'm from the east part of Congo, and in that part, it's not possible to go back. For those people who was from west, uh, they can choose to go back to their place, and the UNHCR can make a plan with uh, the home country and uh, the guest country, how they can re repart repartite them to the home country. But for us who was in the east part, it was not possible to, to, to go back to our home country. The second way is uh, the integration, local integration in the guest country. As I was a refugee in Rwanda, they were supposed to look a place how we can be integrated in, the, in Rwandese population and stay there. But Rwanda is a small country, and he still also tried to rebuild himself. They couldn't open the door to get refugees become uh, uh, Rwandese. Now, the third option is the resettlement. And now UNHCR can uh, try to discuss with, as uh, uh, Kerry presents, that we have uh, almost 10 or 11 countries who welcome the refugees in the world. And they can choose, according to your status, they can discuss your case and send to those countries to look if they can accept your case to be resettled in that, in that country. And for me and my family and the other refugees who are here, our case was sent in the USA. One member of my family, their case was sent in Sweden, and we was separated like that. But me, I get a chance for that, the, the third option of UNHCR was resettlement, now they choose me to go to in USA. That, those, those are the three <laughs> options that um, UNHCR prepared as a durable uh, solution for refugees. And, and we have uh, uh, voluntary repartition to your country. We have uh, integration, local integration, and the resettlement. So now, Paul, you've, um, you're here, and your home is now here in Montana, and it's a word that word home we hear a lot when we're talking about the movement of people. Um, and I um, just uh, share a lot of experience with Kim in our previous lives. In fact, we met in Kosovo during the refugee crisis there in the late 90s. And uh, I wanna share just one quick thought and then to ask Paul one last question, which is, um, I found it very interesting um, in 20 years it, working mostly in refugee camps all around the world. I mean, there's a huge difference in what is happening. But it's quite amazing when you ask people and you get the same answer to the same question almost everywhere you go. I found that very extraordinary. 
And the question one would typically ask, or I would ask, is, you know, what is it you want? You know, you, these people are living in refugee camps for a short time, long time, but a question, the entree was, what do you want? And that can lead into any number of um, different answers. But the answer every time was, I want to go home. That was a 100% practic practical answer to people I met in refugee camps. I found that very interesting. Um, not surprising, of course, but very interesting that everybody answers the same way. So Paul, I, I want to ask a slightly different question. Um, not what do you want, but what, what I want to ask you is how do you define home? Thank you again for, for that question. Yeah, home. I don't know how we can try to put you in my place and try to define home. Home, locally, I think I already buy my house in Missoula, Lolo. And home for me is a place where you can feel free. You can relax when you are tired and you can come home and you take a rest. Home for me is a place of rest where you can relax, you can do whatever you want. Home for me is a place where you can get in when you want, you can get out when you want, and that is home. But if you can try to, to take the example, as you are saying, about uh, home country, as a solution, one of the solutions of UNHCR offering to refugees is uh, the voluntary repartee repart repart to your home country. And that was the best one. No place can be better than home. And for us, the choice should be to go home. In Congo, it's a beautiful country, even if it's in trouble, but I love it. And home for me, it can be that place where, as I say, I feel free. And in my home country, we couldn't have that place because of war. Every time, even some people can be in the meeting like this, and outside the war, you can see the, the sound of gun, and you, you cause the boat. Don't have peace in your home country. But as a home, I say that being in Missoula, I didn't choose that, as you say, uh, teacher show us that uh, wherever, more than one country that welcomed refugees. But they sent my case everywhere, and I didn't know that I should come to USA, but USA chose my case. I didn't know that when the case arrived to USA, they don't, I didn't know what state will choose me, but Montana chose me. And in all Montana, there were a lot of cities here, and Missoula chose me. For, from that, it's okay. I feel home. Home for me is Missoula. And being in Missoula and being here, where I can have the right to speak, to share my story, I feel some, some, the door is open, and I feel home. I am rest. And home for me is a place where you can have the freedom of speech, freedom of doing whatever you want. You can share with friends. I live in Lolo with all my neighborhoods, try to open their door for me, and I feel free. And that's home for me. I don't know if I, I did You did very well. Person. Welcome home, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I want to ask now Helen. Um, who uh, in her introduction was talking about access to healthcare. Um, I'll just uh, preface this by saying I'm a relatively new arrival to Missoula. I, uh, after 20 plus years living overseas, my family and I came here, uh, not as refugees, but as an American citizen, you know, uh, holding my citizenship and a job and all of that. But I confess that navigating uh, the procurement of healthcare was quite dizzying uh, for me. It really was, honestly, having to get health insurance and all of that stuff. So I can only imagine what that must be like for somebody who is coming into our country um, 
as a refugee, asylum seeker, or immigrant. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about the different pathways to, for healthcare and what some of the barriers are for newly resettled refugees in accessing healthcare? Sure, abs absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, and and to be honest, um, I. I work mostly with the resettled refugees. That's who our program worked with. So with regards to people who are not resettled by the IRC, I can only imagine the difficulties they face. I cannot speak that much in detail about their pathways in accessing it. Um, I do know if, if people have come and they're not resettled by the IRC and they're sponsored by someone and they come to Partnership Health, we absolutely um, provide um, as much Help, we provide health care for them, we welcome them as patients, but they don't necessarily receive all the, all the program benefits that people who arrive by way of the IRC do. Um, and that's the group I can really, I can speak a lot more in detail about their accessing health care. And it is, it's dizzying, it's intense. Even from before they leave the country and they have these intense medical screenings um, right before their departure. Um, that really actually helps us when we receive those medical, those forms from those medical examinations, that really helps us plan for their arrival. Um, and the way it works, and, and I also just want to say something really, really quickly, is that um, with this intense process and the health care that they do receive and the services our program does provide, it is a partnership here in Missoula. And there is no way that people would be receiving the health care that they do without those partnerships that we have with, with, you know, with the IRC, with Soft Landing, and with other providers here in Missoula. So it is certainly not just you know, like we're one little entity of the refugee program. It's a, it's a community effort. Um, and so when they, after they do their screening and they're on the way here and we get that and we're planning for their arrival and we, you know, that includes vaccinations, it includes labs. Um, when they get here, we do a home visit to kind of meet them on their own turf in a, in a comfortable setting. Um, so it's not so overwhelming just coming to Partnership Health. Um, the IRC signs them up for Medicaid, so they're going to get medical and dental care through, through Medicaid. Um, and then after they arrive and, you know, we've, we've done this planning, we've done the home visit, it's our hope that within 30 to 60 days, they get a comprehensive medical exam at Partnership Health with a primary provider. And it's from that exam that we then can plan the um, issues. Of course, there are complex medical issues that need to be addressed. And it takes, we intensively assist, I would say, for at least a year. Um, and, and it's not just about scheduling appointments, it's also about um, you know, giving people the tools to, so that hopefully within a couple of years after they receive their green card, that they're able to kind of independently navigate uh, the system and manage their health care. I mean, that's the hope, right? We, we're welcoming people to our country. We're, we're, you know, they're on a pathway to, to a green card in a 12 to 18 months and then citizenship five years down the road. And so with that, we want to give them the tools to navigate their health care as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the pathways, um, the barriers. <laughs> there are barriers, and in in those pathways, are, there are a few large barriers. And I think um, before I even address those barriers, I just want to talk about the concept of cultural humility um, that, that exists in healthcare. And it's really important for us to use that concept um, when, we, when we address the barriers. Um, and for, and so there's, there's three components to that concept. Um, one is the cultural component, um, and it's that understanding and appreciating that others are coming from entirely different healthcare systems. They have different approaches, different systems, different values, they have apprehensions, and it really um, is important to take time to learn about and appreciate and value these differences. Um, the other part about cultural humility to keep in mind is that there's a power imbalance. Um, and you have to acknowledge that, and you have to work hard to reduce that. Um, and we really try to use that in, in our planning with our program. And the third component, and this is also, it's really important, it's accountability. Um, and that means that we as an organization, um, that we take accountability for our actions, the good and the bad, 
and we also um, take account accountability for our program developing development, knowing numbers are growing, knowing that we need to address different issues. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to go too long, but uh, there's three barriers that <laughs> are really big here, really kind of, they loom for us when we're, when we're doing healthcare. One is transportation. And mm. there's so much already done to try and help with transportation. The IRC is amazing for three months. They provide all the transportation needed for all the different healthcare all over Missoula and beyond, because sometimes the healthcare involves going to other states, you know, going to hospitals in other parts of Montana. Um, they also bus train their clients. Mountain Lion and Paratransit are super helpful organizations to work with. Soft Landing is amazing. They get people their driver's license, they get these donations for cars. It's incredible. We're, starting, we're going to start using you know, gas cards in the near future to help out clients. Um, the Mac Church is an, another amazing organization here in town that helps our clients, but still the transportation barrier looms large. Um, it is very, very difficult for, uh, you know, with regard to childcare and, and school age appointments to make those appointments, especially when they're in locations all over the city. For pregnant women, um, there's a huge number of appointments to make in various locations, and often it's, you know, there's only one car in the family, and um, it's used to get back and forth to work, not necessarily to, to get to the different appointments. Um, so it takes time to adapt to the system, and it's really important that we all kind of keep that in mind. Another barrier in that accessing of healthcare is interpretation. Um, we are dealing with, so I, I love languages. It's part of, my, part of my childhood, it's part of my studying, it's part of everything, and I love that I'm so, that I'm around all these different languages, and, um, but it's, you, understanding your healthcare in a different language is extremely difficult. And for any, um, and it needs interpretation, it needs medically certified interpreters. And for any Medicaid recipient, this is a patient right. Um, and that is vital for understanding health care and for, and for building the relationships between the, the clients and the providers. And, um, but it's costly and it's time consuming and not all providers are aware of the requirement for providing medically certified interpreters. And unfortunately, when it's not done well, it leads to confusion, frustration, and distrust. And that's really hard to overcome. So we don't want that to happen. Um, and it can lead to, it can lead to, when interpretation is not used in scheduling appointments, it can lead to people just missing their appointments, not really understanding, not sure of what's being said. Um, it's, uh, intake forms um, are very, very difficult to fill out in a different language. Um, and there is a wide, and the people who are arriving are refugee clients, there's a huge spectrum of literacy. They're arriving from all corners of the world. Some people are pre-literate, some people have a university education. Some people are familiar with the Western alphabet, some people are not. Some people speak multiple languages, some people don't. It's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, and it takes time to figure out systems for navigating this. Uh, and communication is just one of those, it's something that we really want to build up. We don't want it to take us down. Um, so we're constantly working to try and figure out more ways or more effective ways to communicate. And the last barrier I want to just touch on is dental care. It's an issue, it's an issue for everybody, but particularly for the refugee clients who arrive. Um, they are, it is covered by Medicaid, but Medicaid does not cover dental care for adults the same way medical care is covered, and that's truly unfortunate. Um, it is uh, much more difficult to access. Many places do not accept Medicaid. If, even if they do, they are not necessarily accepting new patients. Um, and for those that are, it's a really long wait to get to that, to get that care of partnership health. We have an eight to nine month 
long waiting list for people on Medicaid waiting to become established, or anybody waiting to be established there. Um, and the refugees are often coming from places where routine preventative care just was not the norm. And they're coming with extensive needs um, and the nuances of options using interpretation can lead to many, many misunderstandings and unfortunately the decisions not to use the available care, the cost, if they decide to try and pay for it on their own is prohibitive. It's, um, and it's the same situation that we all face, but it's just that much more intense. Um, and ch but children, thankfully, have unlimited care, aside from orthodontics. Um, and our dental providers in our clinic, the pediatric, a couple of the pediatric dentistries in town, they are incredible. Um, and that has been really positive to see in how they address the needs of the children. So thanks for allowing me to thank talk about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much. So I'll just remind everybody, um, we, we have, I think, 15 or so minutes to go. If you have questions, please write them down, bring it up. I, I can't promise you we're going to get to them, but at any rate, um, let's give it a crack. Now, um, uh, Kim, uh, I have to say, you left me with a bit of a cliffhanger with your opening remarks. Um, it, it's very compelling to kind of zoom out and have a, have a much larger view. And um, you talked about um, uh, the causes. What causes the, these conditions that, that, that make people move in the first place in, in the kind of the most macro sense? Um, but I wonder if you might say a couple more words about that, but also, you know, on, on, the, on one side, those are the conditions that are causing these dynamics in the world. But then what are the capacities that we need to meet these challenges as, as human beings? Can you, can you touch on that? I don't know, is that two sides of the same coin or, or yeah. what have you? But maybe those two things to you. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, there's a danger in zooming out because uh, there is no single answer. And uh, you, you can be left with, well, all you need to do is this, and uh, of course that's not the case. So um, let me just make a couple remarks to sort of blend a little bit of this, I think. Um, I, I just like when you're talking, Paul, is this Maslow's hierarchy. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but basically security, safety is first. If you don't have that, Every single human does whatever they need to do in order to get safe, whether it's food or running away from violence or you know, danger of flooding, whatever it is. And the way that you talked about home is like, that's to me, that's what we're offering here in Missoula is not just safety, but as Maslow goes up the hierarchy, it goes beyond just security. It goes into an, um, you know, feeling good about yourself and making, having accomplishments and, and contributing to the world and so forth. And so ultimately that's what we're headed towards. It's towards this place where we are all, um, I would suggest, interconnected. Um, so to answer the second part of it, one of the things we need to do is to increase our capacity and the visual of our interconnectedness. So in a way, like COVID said you know, to us all, oh my god, we don't get su the supply chain cut off because somebody over in Taiwan can't get this and da 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 and all of a sudden I can't get um, whatever my, uh, the electronics I'm looking for at Best Buy. And we got that. But in a deeper and bigger way, we are humans now on a planet that's in deep trouble. And a lot of it, this is my submission, is because the, we humans have created it in the Anthropocene. So what do we do as a species? Clearly that interconnectedness around the world is essential. To see how the refugees who are fleeing um, a condition, let me just say, um, really inability to care for one's family because there's no jobs, because let's say there's even drought or there's other kinds of conditions that are, that are uh, creating greater and greater unsustainability. So if you finally say, I give up, I gotta go. Um, 
when I go to the store and I buy jeans, how many, how much of that is from labor that's coming from one of these countries that has people in unsustainable jobs that are in sweat, um, sweat factories? Um, and they finally say, I'm done. I got to get out of here. This is not going to work. So this interconnectedness is big. And we, I want to also just take a sideway note that we are all complicit in this world. There's no way you can get around not uh, using paper, uh, using carbon, and so forth. So we're all engaged in this modern world. And for many of us, we also have our eyes on and are heading towards a better, more sustainable, more a regenerative world. And we're th this is what this is about, welcoming people here because we care about them, because they're part of humanity. So I'd say recognizing interconnectedness and trying to live from that, um, which can have many, many different ways of doing it. But another one is some of the things like you're talking about. You've got the bus system in Missoula. You've got um, all kinds of different entities that are networking together, and Soft Landing is a champion at networking. We want to have connections. And the more we network and have things like partnership models, not domination models, and think along those lines, no matter what we're doing, we are moving towards this, this new world, towards this new epistemology, a new world view that will not create the conditions underneath, um, you know, that are causing refugees. And, you know, it, there's obviously a bit of idealism, or a lot of idealism in there. And of course, that's where we need to go. So let's keep doing it. Just, you're, here. you're here tonight. This is it. <laughs> yes. I'm telling you, you're doing it. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Kim. Thanks for that, that perspective. Look, I have a lot of questions up here, and I'm, I'm Kari, I'm glad that you stayed up here because some of these, of course, relate to your remarks and the legal procedures and processes. Um, so I'm going to, um, in no particular order, so I apologize if I don't get to your specific question, but there's so many interesting ones and only so much time. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you if it's okay to run past the 8 o'clock ending time for you. Please stay here as long as you can. Um, you're welcome to. Mary's going to run interference. If there's any u university people who want to kick us out, you'll be like, yeah, you're, you're good. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, let, hold on. I wanted to start with this one. This uh, comes from a person here who's an Afghan refugee. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm, what I'm, I'm, I would like everybody to speak, but I'm just going to hold the microphone on this one. I apologize. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt or be rude, but I think we'll just kind of keep to, to me asking the question here. And I, I will truncate this uh, in part. Um, but uh, this, the gentleman here is, is noting, um, and maybe this is to you, Kari, that the documentation process is quite long. Um, and and, and he's, he's wondering, you know, how to understand this better, how, you know, are there any possible solutions in the near term to the process, the very lengthy process through which one goes? Um, so, th no, <laughs> um, is a short answer. The, the Trump administration, again, with those 1,000 rule changes, they were designed in the most uh, remarkable ways. The mind of Stephen Miller is pretty thorough and methodical. To there was, if there was any way to make things harder or arduous or complicated or long or delayed, he did it. Um, and Biden has not had the same um, uh, energy in undoing it. So work permits that used to take 30 days to be processed are now taking anywhere between eight months and, and eight months and 12 months. So even when people have status, they still can't get work authorization. And so we are living in a time right now which is just, I, it's shocking as someone who's been doing this for 20 years. Um, there's a delay in every imaginable way. Um, I think though, so it's frustrating. It's designed to be frustrating. It hasn't been fixed. And I think my only advice um, to people in that situation is hold on, hold on hope. Um, we, we want, there are 
many, many, many people who want refugees and asylum seekers and immigrants here in our country, and we're still fighting. And so please have hope and hold on, and we'll do the same. Thanks. And I'll just um, tell our panelists, if you would like to add to any of these answers, just give me the high sign, and, and we'll come to you, OK? Um, this next question, uh, um, this is from Samuel. Um, I'm going to ask the question, but I'm also, Samuel, if it's OK, I might kind of turn it around a little bit, too. Um, uh, I think Samuel is referencing, uh, in part, Kari, your um, remarks and the, um, the Reagan quote about, you know, the, the American values. And, and, um, and the question at the end of, uh, of Samuel's point here is, is America aware it has the ability to lose its glory, you know, its, its status, its international status? Um, by reducing immigration. So there's a lot of levels on that one. And so I'd like the other panelists to think about it. It's not simply a question about Reagan and American politics and American values. I think it's a much broader question about how, like Kim just touched on it, how we interact with each other and our human interconnectedness. But first and foremost, um, are, are we aware of this? And anyone can answer, please. You have, it looked like something is on the tip of your tongue. <laughs> a, a little bit, yeah. I mean, I think about that sometimes because every day I'm working with people from so many different cultures, and I, and I feel really fortunate. And then I leave work, and I, and I realize that that's, it's not the norm in Missoula. Um, or, but yet, it's great when, when these opportunities arrive you know, here, and you can see how many people are interested, or you go to the, the different things that happen around town, and you can see the interest. But it is, um, I, c I can see that like sometimes when I'm, or I'm traveling somewhere or you know, in the state or, or talking to people, and you, and you realize that people just aren't necessarily aware of kind of, of for the people who are, for the immigrants and the refugees that are coming in and the issues they face and, and just how important it is to kind of welcome people mm -hmm. um, and, and to make them feel welcome because that is just such an important part of being able to transition to living somewhere else when you're away from what you once knew as home. Um, yeah. Thanks. Kim, would you like to add? Well, I, I, it's interesting. I listen to a humanitarian podcast regularly, and um, they'll every once in a while have donors, uh, and Sweden is one, and uh, U.S. government is often one of the the speakers and the interviewing people, and Sweden <laughs> regularly says, "Yep, we're standing up to the plate. We're the only one in the world who's doing this. We have more immigrants, although." Your slide showed Germany at the top, but you know we're, we're accepting more people than almost anybody, and we're doing the right thing, and we spend this many billions of dollars, and the U.S. comes in, you know, the microphone goes turned. <laughs> yeah, well, um, <clears throat> we, we're we're trying very hard, and we actually have uh, some things on the docket, and we're we're going to be doing this, and it's a colleague of mine who's often um, is the spokesperson for the U.S. And it's challenging. And having worked as a donor um, with the US um, humanitarian organization, it's tough. And it's tough to work in the field in refugee or um, tough places like conflicts and really feel like you're um, fully doing what's possible. So I, I would say that to Sam, um, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and, and I would also say that the U.S. does put out a lot. And the, the energy within the government that gives the money to humanitarian organization, um, you know, there's a lot of vitality there. It's just that these other parts of the government, and ours is pretty complex, not what all of them are, um, you know, we hit, we hit the wall. We hit a lot of competition in our legislature and mm -hmm. things like that. So. Okay. Yeah. Tough. Paul, did you want to add there? Anything? Yeah, uh, I can add, but before that, can you try to 
I can try to understand better the question. Is America ready to lose the glory? Well, I think Samuel's question, are, are, are we aware of it? Are we aware that this, you know, mostly what Kari uh, uh, explained in her remarks, you know, and then culminating with these quotes of how important immigration is for our society and in support of our values, and to not do it would obviously have a, a negative effect. Are we aware of that? But maybe from your perspective, Paul, you know, what, what you think um, in terms of American society, you are now here in the American society as one of us, you know, what do you think about this idea of American glory and values and, and how immigration supports that? Uh, thank you for making that clear. Uh, you know, sometimes when I think about America mm -hmm. and I see the reality here, it will look like America tried to start to forget where they come from. And sometimes I ask myself is, if America is, is not himself, if he can take that person. America is the first country in everything. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> you know that? Yeah. How many of you have you been out of America? <laughs> when, when you are at the border or at the airport, you can see how American and other people are treated at that place. You see, okay, he's proud to be American. But that first place, that being at the first place in everything, by welcoming people. For that, I'm very grateful, and I can say thank you. But I, I don't want to lose that place of starting now, closing the door for those persons who are seeking, seeking safety, to close the door for those persons who are in danger. We have to, to make, to, to see things very clear. I spent 18 years in Rwanda without knowing if I'm, I'm where, where am I, I'm going. I don't know where, where I am. And by being in that situation, all life don't have uh, even a sentence to write. But America is great by opening the door, by being in that situation because as we learn in the story, America was built with refugees. If you are not a refugee, your ancestor was a refugee. And we forget that. I think at the beginning, you know that, okay, I was like, just like them. That's why I have to open the door. But now, as we start to close the door, I have to put myself in the same box. We have to close the door. I think that we, we try to to, to lose or to, to take in the granted, in the granted the, the proud or the, the place that we had in the world. And it can be something that we can't accept or we can't feel proud of it when we close the door, we close the border for people who are seeking safety. And I can't accept that. Great. Thank you for that, Paul. Thanks a lot. So I think, yeah, thanks. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And if I've not gotten to your question, I apologize. It's one immutable fact that these very interesting fora like this, you always have more questions than you have time for. Uh, but maybe if the panelists, if we're afterwards, maybe in the hallway or something, if you'd like to approach them, if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, maybe that they can help you with that. But I, I, I like this one. This is a good way to kind of wrap things up because I think this question can be interpreted in many different ways and looking at your different focus areas or your expertise. And I will say, uh, Mary, so I'm not putting you on the spot at the end. I, I'm giving you fair warning that I think I'm going to ask you for your perspective on this question as well. No, I think, it, I think you'll, you'll be happy, <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll be glad, and we'll be glad to get your perspective as well. Um, but it's a, it's a very straightforward question. Look, um, in Kari's remarks, I was so happy that you gave that historical sweep and that there was um, 
we all know, uh, you know, even if you have a most basic understanding of American history, these kinds of ebbs and flows of immigration, how American society views immigration positively, negatively, up and down over, over the course of our own history. And uh, unless you've been living under a rock for the past six or seven years, you know that our, our, the dialogue inside of our country has gotten quite acute on, on immigration, refugees, and, and, and um, asylum seekers. And so it's a, it's a very key and important issue that brings out a lot of emotion, a lot of passion. Um, and, and so uh, I think this question is right on time. It says, what are some ways we can engage anti-immigration politicians, or maybe I'd substitute politicians just for sentiment, maybe not, not just amongst politicians, but anti-immigration sentiment um, in a constructive dialogue. So all of you will have touched on this in your own lives in different ways. Can you give us your views on ways that we might more constructively engage those who might disagree with immigration? Sure. Yep, Kari, you. So I've, I've been doing this my whole career. Whenever I was on a plane for a hearing, inevitably someone would look over my shoulder and see that I was an immigration attorney and engage and would be very vocal um, with, with their opinions or um, judgments about immigrants. And inevitably, I think the key is to actually engage and talk. Because in that course of this, at the discussion, everyone ended with people wanting more immigrants. I would tell stories. I would ask, do you know what the policy is? Do you know what the law is? And I think at base, when looking at the anti-immigrant sentiment, it truly is irrational. It's based on fear. Um, it's, it's, it's against people's economic interests, it's against people's best interest, and you know, it's against our, our, our values of, of, of American democracy. So I think the key is to actually talk um, and realize that there is common ground, there is bipartisan comp comprehension. Um, I mean, Biden has a 300-page bill. Um, we can debate. We can do 20 pages. You take 20 pages out. There's a lot to be done. So I think the key is just to start talking, and hopefully we will be at the end of our 40 years and we'll have immigration reform again soon. Paul, would you like to take that one up? Okay. Uh, as she said, that, uh, we have to, to remind people. As uh, I, I remember, um, under COVID, they start to teach us how to wash the hands. For me, was, what, what silly education to, to teach people to wash, in, that means people don't wash their hands? <laughs> For me, I was every time at work, five minutes to wash your hands, and you say, okay, we have to sing happy birthday to make that <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> so it's just to, it's okay to remind people that we have to wash our hands to make people, to make things rank better. And for challenging those people who are anti-immigrants, it's just to, to educate again people, to try to teach again people. It's not, it's not uh, uh, having a degree in this we need. It's to educate people how they can live together with peace. Sometimes we forget easily where we are coming from. And I was thinking about a story of uh, even in a, in a family, when the first baby is coming, we are happy. But the second one, when it's coming, the first one will be jealous for them. The same parent, father, mother, but the, the oldest can jealous the, the youngest. But at the end of the day, he's, he's going to take care of his brother or his sisters. OK, yeah, he's happy with him. And it's the same. When we, we can try to educate again people, OK, you are the firstborn. And for example, Paul can be the third one, and you are the second one. And at the beginning, we can start to be jealous one another. And it's still, but at the end of the day, we can sit together in the family as America is a, a big mother, and we are all his children, 
we can sit together is just to remind one another. We are the children of one mother, and we can remind that as we was uh, learning how to wash our hands, we can try to say, okay, don't forget where we are coming from. We are the same. As a, in the Refugee Congress, we, we have a refugee for, from all countries. And we don't see refugee in the, their color, their status. We just see the color of our blood. We have the same blood. We don't have a Syrian, Iraqi, we don't have a refugee from Afghanistan. We see all refugees and immigrants in one color, the color of our blood. And it's easy for us also to make that choice, to, to educate ourselves that we have to wash again our hands, to, to wash our minds, mm -hmm. and to think only <laughs> where our safety will come from. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're here. You're here. Helen, Kim, you want to jump in on constructive dialogue? I can't feel them. No. <laughs> it's not easy to <laughs> no, follow <it's> Paul. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, I hardly agree with both, with everything that has been said, you know, about engaging and about how we, we all kind of need to appreciate each other and, and realize we're coming from the same the same sentiment and and really even when I, I I think that's so very true and I you know for anyone who you know for pointing out the barriers that people face it's amazing to see a year down the road how people overcome and reduce the barriers and become productive members and that's you know uh, that's just what happens as we all kind of live together and welcome each other and make it easier for each other so I mean that's that's the conversation to me that needs to happen is that we're building society, you know, we're not breaking it down. And um, I I've, know I've mentioned to uh, Chris before, but my parents came over. My dad was a refugee. He came over from Germany, didn't have the paperwork, <laughs> was going to be sent back to Nazi Germany. And the kindness of someone let, he was able to stay, um, and his mother. And, you know, it, I'm so grateful for that being able to happen. And here, you know, here we all are today. And just, you know, to welcome and to be able to kind of pay that back a little bit is huge. And to just keep saying, like, let's keep building our society. Everyone can be a part. There's no, there, there's no reason to, to block it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll add just a few please, points because it's well, well said. Um, yeah, the human, we're a human species, and unfortunately, we're killing ourselves. And we're in um, a state where we must recognize our interdependence or we're gonna die together. Um, and, and within that is also, you know, the person who is sitting there saying, no, no, you know, why are you taking our jobs? Are you doing this? There's something within them that is scared. And when we have that ability to see the humanist within them, it's not about the information. It's not about how many jobs are being taken or not taken. That just, that's just the, the fluff. Getting into why are you scared and being human with them, I think goes, that, that, that's sort of the inroad. Um, and then just the last thing I'd say is, there's a danger in our current modern world of reductionism. You know, what's the problem with our climate or environment? Well, you, it's this, it's this, it's this, and you get down to one thing, carbon. Really? Is that the problem? It's the problem is we haven't been caring about our environment. So when we reduce it down to your anti-immigration or your this, we have lost that part of humanity that you're talking about. Um, so we need to just be careful of reductionism, I think. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Kim. <laughs> Mary, yeah, please. <laughs> Mary, I, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I do know that a lot of your work is in constructive dialogue in communities around Montana. Is there anything that you would care to add on, on how we can understand that? Do you want a mic? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. Well, come, okay. So, um, 
let me just very quickly then, I'll wrap up the panel part and then I'll hand it over to you. Sure. Is that good? Okay, so um, how about another round of applause for these extraordinary people? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Mary's gonna wrap up, uh, but I I've known Mary for as long as I've been here. So I'm just gonna say one quick word, Mary. Yes, I am, of course I am. So, uh, uh, three and a half years ago when I came here, I was, had the very good fortune of meeting a lot of people in Missoula. I, I made a point of going out and drinking coffee and meeting all these people and trying to learn how does life work in Missoula after 25 years overseas. And uh, I always asked people that I had a coffee with, who should I meet with? Who, who do you suggest I should see next? And the first 10 people all said, have you met Mary Poole at Soft Landing? And after hearing that 10 times, I was like, I better go see Mary Poole at Soft Landing. Uh, and, and so I did. And so um, it's been really my great pleasure to get to know Mary and all of her colleagues at Soft Landing who do quite an extraordinary piece of work here in our community. Now, I know I'm, I'm speaking a bit to the converted here, and I don't mean to embarrass you, Mary, but I, I think that there is a point to be made here that um, we know that colleagues from Soft Landing and, and friends from IRC and others all around the country are doing some quite extraordinary work helping with the very theme of tonight, which is how do we welcome people? How do we welcome people into our communities? And we know that that's the bulk of, of your work. Uh, but the other part of that work is something that Paul mentioned so eloquently now, which is the teaching and educating of us, the community, about what is going on. How do we understand this? How do we know what is happening and how can we learn about it in a way that, look, I, I might disagree with you, but I can still be constructive and under, understanding of what is going on. And that part of the soft landing work is really, you know, that's what's happening here tonight. And I just want to say how pleased I am and thankful that I'm a part of that. So I wanted to recognize the soft landing people here tonight for helping us tonight understand a little bit better. With that, yes, why not? Yeah. Why not? With that, now, Mary, come up for the wrap-up. Oh, this is awkward. No. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to our panelists. I mean, I really, truly, I'm flattered that you think I would have more to add, but I, I don't. I mean, you guys have said it. You are in it every day. Um, you mentioned things like kindness. You mentioned things like seeing the humanity in others. Um, you mentioned just relearning um, all of our experiences. I came at this from nothing. I came at this not knowing any of this information, um, but just knowing what it felt like to be a mother to a child that had needs and that other people were going through that same exact experience as I was in much harder situations. And so getting down to that humanity piece and um, getting a, being able to hear people's real true stories and experiences. And I do hope that that's what Soft Landing can continue to bring to our community. Um, and thank you everyone for being on this journey and adventure with us because we all learn every day. Um, and anyway, with that, you have been very patient and wonderful guests. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming. If you do want uh, to get more involved or want any more information about what we're doing here in the community, more ways that we welcome, we have folks will be out front. We have a table out there. You can sign up for our newsletter, um, chit chat with us. But I just want to give another incredible thank you for Chris and all of our panelists and Kari, our speaker today, uh, for sharing with us. So thank you. And they probably suggested that you meet with me because they knew that I just wanted to drink more beer and drink more coffee. So. Thank you.